Welcome, everyone. I am uh, Patricia Rosenmeyer, faculty director of the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies, and I'm delighted to see you all. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Sylvia and Irving Margolis Lecture on the Jewish Experience in America. This lectureship was made possible by generous gifts from Alan and Gail Fields and Gary and Sandra Smiley in honor of Gail and Sandra's parents, who were longtime residents of Williamstown, sorry, Williamston, North Carolina. Their father, Irving Margolis, co-owned a clothing business for 52 years, and their mother, Sylvia Levy Margolis, was a woman of valor in her small town. She was the driving force behind integrating the Williamston Library in the 1960s so that black children could check out books alongside their white peers. She was president of the North Carolina Association of Jewish Women and one of the founders of the North Carolina Jewish Home for the Aged. Our lecture tonight honors both Sylvia and Irving and their identity as American Jews. And I'm delighted to have some family members in the front row here, Jackie and Andrew Fields Cohen here in the audience with us. These events, uh, as you probably have heard before, are made possible through gifts to the center. In fact, everything we do depends on the support of alumni, community members, and friends. So if you'd like more information on how you can contribute to the center and help us meet our mission, I encourage you to visit us at jewishstudies.unc.edu. We are so pleased to have Ariella Kaiser with us tonight for the 2024 Margolis Lecture. Dr. Kaiser holds a PhD in demography from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and was a research professor at Trinity College Hartford, where from 2005 to 2019, she was also associate director of the Institute for the Study of Secularism in Society and Culture. She's the recipient of the 2021 Marshall Sclair Award given by the Association for the Social Scientific Study of Jewry to quote, a senior scholar who has made significant scholarly contribution to the social scientific study of Jewry. End quote. She's also co-author of quite a few volumes, including, sorry, she's co-author of the book, Religion in a Free Market and The Next Generation, Jewish Children and Adolescents, and has also co-edited volumes on secularism in relation to women, science, uh, and, and most recently, a volume titled The Diversity of Worldviews Among Young Adults. Dr. Kaiser's presentation this evening is based on research data collected when she was co-principal investigator for the class of 1995, or if you prefer um, uh, the other way of counting years, 5755, Longitudinal Study of Young American and Canadian Jews, 1995 to 2019. She was also the US principal investigator for a similar project, Young Adults and Religion in a Global Perspective, 2015 to 2018. Tonight, she will present the 2024 Margolis Lecture on Anti-Zionism Quickly Became Anti-Semitism on Campus, Voices of Jewish College Students. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ariella Kaiser. Good afternoon. I assume you can hear me. Thank you so much for the invitation to present today. So let's start. Um, here are uh, voices of Jewish college students. Many were yelling insults at us, some spat at us, including poor me on crutches, and some even attacked people in the line violently. An elderly Holocaust survivor was knocked down and kicked. I felt threatened, offended, and disgraced at the animalistic behavior of the anti-Semite. Another student. Like on any campus, there are always anti-Zionist, pro-Palestinians rallies. It is often discouraging how much support they receive and how bashing Israel appears to be the trendy thing to do on campuses across the world. One more here. Yes, I have experienced anti-Zionism many times. A lot of people around me in classes, even friends, were extremely anti-Israel 
at first I was shocked and disturbed by it, but then I started to realize that it was fueled by ignorance and lack of knowledge and ultimately propaganda. These testimonies from Jewish college students are not from October 2023. They were voices of college students from two decades ago. The Jewish students described anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism on campus in 2003. Let me tell you about the unique study I'm drawing on. The longitudinal study of American and Canadian uh, raised in conservative synagogue began in 1995 in collaboration with colleagues from uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, JTS. It was carried by Barry Cosman and me. Uh, it employed what we called mixed methods design, tracking the development of Jewish identity by conducting both surveys and in-depth conversations with early millennials. Over 1,400 respondents. They were born in 1981. This is the first year the, of the millennial generation. In 1994-95, they celebrated their bar bat mitzvah. So here you have the different phases, what we call first the uh, quantitative um, parts of the, the study, the surveys that were conducted. First, the bar bat mitzvah uh, um, survey it, in 1995, uh, telephone interviews with the young uh, um, celebrants, 13 to 14 years old, uh, telephone surveys with them and with their parents separately. Four years later, we went back and re-interviewed the young people. They were in high schools. Four years later, we re-interviewed them during their college. Then we had a, a, a long break that the, until 2018. We called it the 20 plus up, and we uh, interviewed them during their, uh, um, uh, actually, they were 37, 38 years old. We also have what we called collected qualitative uh, um, data that are based on in-depth interviews in 2003 with the college students, and then again as recently as in 2019. By repeating survey questions to the same individuals in different stages of their life cycles, we can make comparisons over time and create what we call the movie, uh, not only a snapshot that you get from a single survey. The trove of data accumulated over two decades from four savers, se surveys and from the, the in-depth uh, conversation. And what we did, it was unique at that time. We um, interviewed participants that also completed the surveys recruited them to participate in a whole week of conversations. Each day was devoted to a specific topic, the family, dating and uh, relationships, religious life on campus, Jewish identity, anti-Semitism, and the future. So what does it mean to be young conservative uh, Jew today? Conservative Jews are referred to as Jews in the center. Ju conservative Judaism is situated in the middle between the more uh, traditional Orthodox and the more liberal reform. One of the major changes undergoing the conservative movement since the beginning of the 1980s as our respondents were growing up was an expansion of women's roles uh, as leaders, becoming rabbis, cantors, uh, and ritual, direct, ritual directors. By introducing egalitarian practices in congregational life, women were leading religious services, reading uh, Torah, chanting the Haftorah, delivering sermons, and serving 
as prayer leaders, roles that were used to be reserved to men. Young girls and boys received an egalitarian religious upbringing. That meant similarities in their bar and bat mitzvah training and synagogue uh, experiences. So we asked uh, um, the, the student to describe what it is like being a conservative uh, uh, on campus. And one of the students uh, uh, replied, I think being a conservative Jew is a happy medium in college. I dislike reform Judaism in the sense that I feel it loses a lot of Jewish culture and the Torah in it. However, uh, with the load of college, I couldn't see having as great of commitment as being an Orthodox Jew. I believe that uh, 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 students here can relate to the reflections of this student. In this short quote, we are reminded of two aspects on the ongoing question, who is a Jew? The religious uh, identity and the culture identity. So what does being Jewish mean to our Jewish millennials? So here is a question that is asked also in other surveys. And I'm going to read you what, what the, the um, students were asked. There are many different ways of being Jewish. For you personally, how much, if at all, does being Jewish involve? And so there were a battery of statements, and they had to kind of uh, say if it's a lot, or somewhat, or not at all uh, um, important to them. So for the most of the bar mitzvah class, uh, Jewishness is closely connected to events in Jewish history. And you can see what's ranked at the top, remembering the Holocaust, followed by leading an ethical and moral life, and then caring uh, about Israel. This uh, rank order is similar to answers to questions about meaning of being Jewish of Taglit birthright participants of the same millennial generation. And this ranking also reflects the Jewish education uh, our participants uh, have, have uh, received. If uh, just to remind those who don't know, the bar but mitzvah training involves very in the at least two years, especially in the conservative movement, that involvement in, in synagogue life and, and studying. Uh, in fact, the whole family has to go for the whole, the year of the bar bat mitzvah, they have to go weekly to, to the, 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 the synagogue. After the, the bar mitzvah year, many stop going and, and that's something that we track in high school and then again in college and look I pointed at the top ranking, but go down and see from the fourth, from the down, observing Jewish uh, law and, you know, halacha. See if I can do this. This one here. Only 22% of the, the students said a lot. And even go further down, synagogue attendance, only 17% said that it's, you know, very much important to, for them being Jewish. So there is a steady erosion of religious observance among conservative Jews. That trend has not spared our Jewish millennials. Over the years that we have followed them, there is a decline in synagogue attendance, but also in other re religious rituals like keeping kashrut. At the same time, Jewish peoplehood remained strong. So Jewish peoplehood refers to feeling connected and committed to help Jewish people, feeling a responsibility to help Jews around the world. That was expressed in high school, in prevailed in college, and also in the very last uh, phase in, uh, at age 37, 38. Now going back to the college years, and I wanna briefly, briefly, uh, tell you about the historical moments of 2000 to 2004. 
two major events happened as the Bar Bat Mitzvah class started their college years. The terror attacks on September 11 in 2001 on American soil and the war of, on terrorism that followed changed the political climate in the United States. And in Israel, the second intifada, the Palestinian uprising erupted in September 2000 and lasted until 2005. These were the college years for our respondents, a period marked by terrorist attacks and violence, suicide bombing left a thousand Israeli civilians dead, the Israeli forces retaliated against the Palestinians' aggressors as the numbers of casualties rose, so did tensions on university campuses. Opposing Israel's policies, anti-Israel demonstration and economic and academic boycotts of Israel, the BDS campaigns were organized on many uh, campuses, creating hostile environment for Jewish students. And here are some testimony uh, from 2003. In the first weeks of the Intifada, the windows in a classroom building were plastered with pictures of Palestinian children that had been killed. Another student. It was right after the second intifada started. I, it quickly became very tense on campus. The Palestinians group organized and they had several very strong leaders. There were frequent protests on both sides of the issues. Friends and I admittedly stopped wearing Stars of David and any other Jewish symbol. We had several incidents at the Hillel, including a brick thrown through the door. And that student concluded, anti-Zionism quickly became anti-Semitism. That's kind of the title that uh, chose here. So going back to anti-Semitism on and off uh, campus, I want to talk about perceptions and experiences of this uh, uh, million co cohort. Anti-Semitism hurts the individual Jew who experienced it directly and personally, but it also hurts other Jews emotionally when they witness an incident. Nevertheless, defining a particular incident or event as a case of anti-Semitism is open to interpretation and discussion. Just as the pain threshold varies within populations, so sensitivity to hostility and incivility also varies among people. So here's an example of a testimony of the experiences of the college students again um, in 2003. I was a member of a sorority and when it came time to select new pledges, some of the non-Jewish girls told us to make sure we didn't turn too Jewish. Also another sorority sister at one point said, if you go to that bar, don't go to the Jewish bouncer. When I asked her how she knew he was Jewish, she said his nose. This same girl had previously made comments about not going to a Sami, a Jewish fraternity party, because the guys there will only date Jewish girls and who would want to date them anyway? These experiences have made me realize that we are not liked by many. So, um, during college, we asked participating students if they have ever been subjected to anti-Semitism in their neighborhood and if they were subjected to anti-Semitism at school. In all, you see, we estimate that about a third, 35%, were subjected to anti-Semitism on or off campus. That's a 10 plus 12 plus 13%. The longitudinal design allows us to track changes over time. So in the Barbara Mitzvah uh, study, I'm just um, gonna repeat, we follow the same cohort 
from adolescence to adulthood, from age 13 all the way to age 38. So in the first uh, um, wave of the study, the Bnei and Bnot Mitzvah as adolescents were highly influenced by their parents, their primary socialization agents. In middle school and high school, formal Hebrew school and informal the summer camp and youth group institutions become influential in shaping adolescents' worldviews. In college, the authority of the family and religious institutions, the synagogue, for example, is diminished, while the authority of professors and peers on campus uh, is increased. So now, uh, here's a plot that I will go slowly to, to, to explain. We show what we call the transition in probabilities for experiencing anti-Semitism. So um, in the left-hand side, let's see that. Am I doing this right? I don't know where it is. Where is Paul? Am I doing it right? OK, here, sorry. This. You can see uh, um, that, that in 1995, and then we have 95 to 99, and then 99 to 2003. Darker, uh, whatever the orange cell uh, cells represent large percentages, and the darker blue represents smaller uh, uh, percentages. Um, about 72% you know, said that they were not subjected. Uh, about a third said that they were subjected to uh, anti-Semitism in 1995. Um, what you see in the middle one, and I'll just explain, the, the transition from uh, what happened in 95 to 1999, and, and uh, um, the act, the, the, this one, shows you the axis, the, what, you know, this is the initial, and then the Y, where we're kind of moving towards. Note that, that the, the column sum to 100%. So for example, if we look at this 71%, it means that among respondents who did not experience anti-Semitism in 1995, 71% of them also did not experience anti-Semitism in 1999. In the middle panel, uh, um, respondents are more stable than not, OK? Um, so they're more likely to stay in the same states than change. But the shift between the states is fairly balanced uh, between the two. So, so we have. 29% of those who were not subjected to anti-Semitism in the first wave reported that they were subjected to it in wave two, compared to like 33% of respondents who said they were subjected to it in 1995, but not in uh, the second uh, wave. The right-hand side looks different. Here, we still see that about three quarters, the 75% of those who were not subject to anti-Semitism in wave two reported they still did not, uh, were not subject to uh, anti-Semitism during college. But those who were subjected to, to it in uh, 1999 were split in, in wave three. They were just as likely to have experienced anti-Semitism as not. So how can we explain these findings, especially the evenly split uh, during college? It is possible that the student made more of a distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism than in the past. The college survey uh, was the first uh, with a separate uh, question about anti-Zionism, uh, and that's something that we'll uh, get to it um, shortly. So we showed you about the experiences of uh, anti-Semitism. Now I want to talk about perception. 
of anti-Semitism. So um, in surveys, in different surveys, also uh, respondents are asked, is anti-Semitism a major problem for Jews? And, and um, see what our students said. So if you see that in, in um, it, they began in the, the first stage, about 70% of them thought that anti-Semitism is a major problem, but that dropped you know, in high school and uh, uh, during college. The 70% is very similar to what their parents said you know, separately at that time. So this is the time that they were really influenced and that's what they heard at home. Now the next uh, uh, plot, digs deeper, uh, deeper uh, in vis uh, vis kind of showing the movement between the waves in perceptions towards anti-Semitism. On the left uh, hand side, again, labeled as 1995, at age 13, 14, we find probability of saying that anti-Semitism is a major uh, uh, problem. Uh, um, and, and it's about two thirds that said, thought so. Um, in the middle section, uh, respondents were more likely to stay in the same state than change. And then we, use, we see about four, four in five uh, in 10, like 42% and 37% of those in either state that switched. Um, and you know, it be in, in both directions. The, the, the third panel, labeled from 1999 to 2003. Um, it's very similar as what we see in, in the uh, middle one, except they re refer to pro the probability of moving from 1999 to 2003. Once again, we see that movement between the two states is fairly balanced with about a third uh, of each moving towards the other. That's the, the, this one and this one. Um, so for researcher, the, the kind of next question is, is there alignment between experiencing anti-Semitism and the perception uh, about uh, the seriousness of anti-Semitism? Does this alignment change across time? And here, we, we're going to look at what I called this consistency. So what does it mean consistent? Consistent means that both respondents don't experience it and don't think it is a problem. So if somebody's thinking, I don't have that problem, therefore it must not be a problem overall. But it could be also looked at they do experience anti-Semitism and they think it is a problem. I've experienced it, therefore it must be a problem. So if we look at, at what's happened here, uh, um, the consistency over time, like from age 13 to age 21, 22, um, it increased the consistency between 1995 to 1999, and then a little bit more between uh, um, 1999 to 2003. About nearly two thirds are consistent in their experiences uh, and, and perceptions. So the next plot breaks it even further. And, and look what we're doing here. We're looking at this consistency. Does it matter if they were subjected to anti-Semitism or if they were not subjected to anti-Semitism? Um, the blue uh, shows the percent of those who did not experience anti-Semitism, uh, who say that it is not a major problem, so that, that they're consistent. The kind of the orange shows a percent of those who did experience anti-Semitism, who report that it is a major uh, problem, they are consistent. Notably, we see that those who do experience anti-Semitism drop inconsistency across time, while those who did not experience it increased uh, inconsistencies. So 
one way of interpreting these results uh, is to say that both groups are less likely to say that anti-Semitism is a major problem across time, which matches the previous, what we saw before. But this is manifested as consistency for those who don't experience it and inconsistency for those who do, since there are more respondents who don't experience this, don't experience about 60%, then the overall consistency increases across time. Now let's move to anti-Zionism. As I said, we asked in college separately whether they were ever affected by anti-Zionism on campus. Uh, this distinction is rare in surveys. It's, it's seldom asked. Our college students distinguished between incidents related to anti-Semitism and those related to anti-Zionism. Uh, we didn't ask these questions before. So Zionism, the belief that the Jewish people maintain a right to self-determination in their ancestral homeland has been central, a central tenet uh, of Judaism for thousands of years. Zion refers to Israel. Unfortunately, in some circle, Zionism has come to be labeled uh, settler colonialism. Perhaps not surprising today, but in 2003, it was an eye-opening to us, the researchers, um, that college students were equally, and this is here, uh, um, they were equally likely to claim to have been personally affected by anti-Zionism and by anti-Semitism. So if you looked at uh, the, uh, this is the yes to the anti-Zionism, so that's 36%. And if you remember the yes to anti-Semitism, that's the 35%. You know, 90% said yes to both. So, here are some of the uh, testimonies. Wait, Just a second. No. Okay, I'll I'll read to you. I I must have uh, don't have that slide. So some testimonies from, from, from uh, uh, students. There is anti-Zionist propaganda all over my school. I'm talking, this, this is from 2003. Anti-Zionist conversation to be heard in my hallway. Another student. In the middle of, of class, someone made an anti-Semitic comment and an argument started about Zionism. It resulted in a fight. These types of incidents upset me because while I'm very pro-Israel, I understand the Palestinian right to a state and I do, know, I do not know a solution. It is so sad that there is such a situation today. So the, the college students encountered anti-Israeli rallies, even what was framed as an intifada day on some uh, uh, campuses challenging uh, the right of Israel to exist, all of which could rattle students' ties and support of Israel. Perhaps surprising, it actually ignited Israel solidarity. We found a rise in college students' Israel consciousness and Zionist outlook that might have been attributed to the political situation in the Middle East in the uh, early 2000s when they attended college. We believe that as the Jewish homeland was under attack, attachment to Israel has become an important part of their personal Jewish identities. And if you recall that, that chart that I showed you about the meaning of being Jewish, uh, um, the, the, the caring for 
about Israel was ranked third from the, from the top. Um, so you might ask me, you know, so what has been carried on until age 37, 38? That's kind of our fourth phase of the study. That generation that, that uh, or cohort that we study, the Bnei and Bnot Mitzvah, represented a homogeneous cohort of Jewish millennials. They were all raised in conservative uh, synagogue. Born in early 1980s, they benefited from extended Jewish education, most in a supplementary Hebrew school, but some uh, uh, attended day, uh, day school. An important part of their growing up, almost all of them, 95% were raised by two Jewish parents. At age 37, 38, they have become heterogeneous. Many, as you expect, are married, of whom about 40% are intermarried. So very different from their parents' generation so, and, and the way they were raised. So if we look at uh, um, how they self-identify themselves, when we ask them about their current uh, um, Jewish denomination, so you see that only 44% here, only 44% um, identify themselves as conservative uh, Jews, although they were all raised in the conservative movement, uh, which is very similar to, to uh, um, retention, what we call the retention rate among conservative Jews in general. Uh, about 41% from youth to adulthood, according to uh, the Pew study in uh, 2020. There's another important kind of for us that do the research. Look at uh, culturally Jews, those who said um, culturally Jews, and those who said none just Jewish, humanist. So, so if you count them together, it's about a third that kind of distance themselves from any Jewish denomination. The millennial generation is a major contributor to, to this overall uh, uh, trend of people who distance them, themselves from, from any uh, uh, denomination, any religious denomination. I've written extensively about the rise of the nuns, that's N-O-N-E-S, people who say they have no religion. So the cultural and political uh, context have uh, changed in the 15 years since this cohort studied as undergraduates in college. Global societal transformation have contributed to an attitudinal and behavioral uh, shift. Today, social media is how many young people consume information, exchange ideas. The current geopolitical environment portrays Israel as the main culprit in the Middle East uh, conflict. Liberal Jews criticize the government of Israel. They disapprove of the government's policy on the settlements and the treatment of Palestinians. With time, attitudes toward Israel have shifted. So for us, you know, one of the interesting questions, how have these members of the Barbara Mitzvah class changed over the years? And I uh, want to show you about The, the, and I'll walk slowly here because there, there are a lot here. So one way for us to measure uh, attachment towards Israel is a question that, again, was repeated in, in the, the four uh, surveys from 1995 to 2018, how important Israel is to you. So if you look at, at the top, and here is the age from the very beginning, the, the year of the Bar Mitzvah, 13 to 14, high school, college, and the most uh, uh, currently. At the, at the very beginning, nobody said that uh, Israel is not at all important to them. 
just tiny, tiny, tiny bit said not very. It was, was either somewhat here, and actually most of them said that Israel is very important to them. Look at it, how high it was in, in uh, 1995, dropped a little bit in, in uh, age 18 in high school, went up, that's what I was talking about, that kind of surge in the solidarity uh, uh, towards Israel as they felt that Israel was attacked on, 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 uh, uh, a, on the co college campuses. Here also, we compare those who have visited Israel and those who don't or did not. Visiting Israel, kind of the exposure to Israel, the, the land, the, is the people, the more familiar you are, the more attached you become. Those who visited were exhibited higher uh, um, attachment towards Israel than those who did not. But look at the trend, what happened here. They dropped from the college years to more current. Uh, the strong solidarity with Israel of the college students has receded with time. The age 37, 38, some of the Jewish millennials have become more critical towards Israel and exhibited weaker attachment. So here is uh, um, some of what they're saying. So that's now I'm switching to kind of the narratives that, that uh, you know, kind of illuminate the survey, uh, 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 what we find in the surveys. It gives us the kind of the personal uh, uh, stories. So the first person said, I'm upset with how Israelis are treating Palestinians. It is not right to suppress culture, uh, a culture after Jews were once suppressed. I don't believe that endless war is justified. So I told you about the longitudinal study. When we, we uh, uh, repeat questions over time, I can look at that person and see what were the answers to the specific question and, and specifically about the attachment to Israel at age 13, age 17, college year, and, and, and currently. So how the, the attitudes have shifted, have changed uh, over kind of the life course of that respondent. And now uh, um, tells me how, uh, um, you know, expressing the feeling. So listen to what we, we kind of detected on that uh, student. So in, during the bar mitzvah year, said someone, to, Israel is someone to important, went up in high school to very important, again dropped to somewhat important, and more recently saying that Israel is not very important. That respondent never visited Israel, and the recent drop in Israel solidarity is highlighted by the harsh criticism that we, we read here, and kind of in that person's voice. The second person that said, said in 2018, I have very mixed feelings about uh, the state of Israel. These uh, are the words of a respondent who consistently, 95, 99, 2003, 2018, said that Israel is somewhat important and has visited Israel once in the uh, last 10 years. Another respondent is more positive uh, viewing Israel as a fundamental uh, Jewish inspiration, going to honeymoon Israel, birthright for couples, was also at a time when I felt most connected to Judaism. As you might have expected, that person has expressed strong sentiment towards Israel from adolescence to uh, uh, adulthood, from age th 13 to 37, 38, when asked how important is Israel to you, answered consistently very important. So to current events, 
The horrific Hamas attacks on October 7th in 2023 were devastating to the people of Israel and to Jews around the world, evoking memories of the Holocaust. How did members of the Bar Bat Mitzvah class respond, feeling the responsibility to help uh, fellow Jews? Did they rush to help and support Israel? We simply don't know. If there is an opportunity to address these re research questions in a fifth phase of the longitudinal, longitudinal study, it would be wonderfully insightful. Thank you. Thank you so much for a thought-provoking, fascinating uh, talk. And um, I think Dr. Kaiser is willing to answer questions. If any students need to leave for any reason, we understand. But otherwise, um, we're happy to take questions from the floor. I would just ask that you use the microphone. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. I'd be interested in your thoughts about potential sources of bias in the study, recall bias of people who were subjected to traumatic events and therefore will recall with more drama what they think happened, but may or may not have happened, and also the potential bias in your blue and orange graphs about whether if I cared enough to go to Israel, therefore I am more attached to Israel, as opposed to going to Israel makes me feel more attached and maybe self-fulfilling, for example. So, so the, the, the really beauty of, of the longitudinal, that we don't count on people to, to, let's say, I asked them in 2003 what happened in 1995. I know what they answered us in 1995. So it's not... That bias, at least, is not kind of uh, uh, of memory or, or just making something as, as more positive or, or, or uh, less negative based on what happened to me is happening to me now or what's the situation now. Because we are following them kind of, and especially the fact that we repeated the same questions. So th that is something uh, uh, that we can um we document it we are very careful as social scientists not to claim any you know, kind of cause and effect we have to be very careful on on, on that and if you recall uh the the graphs that i showed and you uh asked about visiting israel visiting israel can go both ways uh, um israelis demonstrate, Israelis uh, uh, express uh, uh, a, their misgiving about their, their uh, a government and the policies. They go and they demonstrate. So you can see both ways even when you go. You can be fall in love with the country, fall in love with the people, but you can see many, many ways that, that, that people relate to, to the ongoing events that happens there. So I have two, two sons that are exactly in your cohort study, and um, uh, so I can, uh, I have a question to ask you and tell you where they are right now if you wanted to do this. this How thing. old are they? So uh, 41 and 43. So, so they're exactly... That's why I said they're exactly... When did they have the Barbara Mitzvah? The, the, 95 was one, 90, you know. So anyway, okay. so what, one, one went to Yale, had two Jewish roommates. Um, they, they celebrated Shabbat every Friday. Um, they went to Birthright. They were in a klezmer band. Um, they, <laughs> he makes challah to this, whole wheat challah every Shabbat to this day. His wife's not Jewish. Um, they, they're raising their children Jewish. 
he's taking a hundred of his students. He's a high school choir teacher to the uh, Jewish Heritage Museum in New York City to sing Jewish songs. And yet um, his wife is very active in Black Lives Matter and is pro-Palestinian. And when I was there for Hanukkah, his children let me know that they're, when I, I brought them uh, bracelets to, to, you know, make bracelets on Israel Chai, they let me know they were on the other side. My other son went to Princeton, uh, didn't have Jewish roommates, didn't have Jewish friends, didn't do birthright, also didn't marry someone Jewish. He's been very active and is horrified by what's going on since October 7th. And so I want to ask you, you know, like that to me and to kind of where, where Ed was going with the question, I mean, both are very committed. They celebrate holidays and they're involved and they go to shul and they, and yet one, one has, you know, drank the Kool-Aid of what's out there in public media, despite still feeling very Jewish. He's, um, you know, I, I just, I, I don't understand it. So I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on that. You are describing your, your, your two children are really the, the Jewish population. You, you, in, in as much as we uh, um, have to be careful, like, you know, I was trained as a statistician, you know, not to take the, the sample of one or two and extrapolate for, for the whole population. But that's exactly how the Jewish population looks like. I have in one, uh, 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 place that I quote um, a young person who said, I love Israel. That's why I, I'm so critical of Israel. So, so it goes, you know, in, in both ways. It, it's, it's uh, um, so many people will tell you that they are, they care so much. So they are on the streets demonstrating. And, and if I may say, I hope that we don't disqualify them as people that don't like Jews and they don't like uh, even Israel, even if uh, uh, they criticize Israel. So, and, and I have to tell you that even more and more in surveys, so, you know, kind of to, to engage and understand public opinion, there are more and more questions they try to separate between criticizing what we call the policies of the government on Israel, then what we don't like to hear is Israel has no right to exist. That's very different from being a, a critical of certain policies. So, so that's where a distinction uh, is made. And I don't know who's here that have, has not heard the, from the river to the sea, the, the, the people object when those who don't know which river and which sea uh, uh, um, use that, that uh, phrase and so likely and, and as, as one of the students in 2003 told us, it's propaganda and it's ignorant. And so that's where uh, I have no problems with your sons. Thank, thank you for that talk. It was really fascinating. Um, very, very new to me. I mean, the, 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 the scientific aspect of the demography. So I guess part of my question is also the method and the presentation. You began with these quotes uh, that very strongly evoked a sense of students experiencing anti-Semitism actively on campus. If I understood, though, your presentation of the data, this generation, which was mm -hmm. just slightly, I mean, I was on campus at that time, not as that age or older, but as a graduate student, I never heard of anything mm -hmm. like that um, from any students. And it was a very, you know, it was, well, that, that bad old university, Harvard, um, much in the news now. Uh, but um, I'm wondering what the relationship is between the quotes with which you began mm -hmm. and the data that you then presented, because the quotes very strongly suggested that students were out there having these kind of real real time experiences of anti-Semitism, the data seem to suggest a more complex picture. 
So I'm just wondering method a lot. It's a little bit of a methodological question, but I'm also just trying to understand your conclusions. So, so I'll, I'll answer it uh, this way. So first of all, it's true, um, A, that the best way, you know, this mixed methods really, uh, um, one informs the other. So, so you have the general trend, and then in order to illustrate some of the feelings, the emotions, and um, really understand the how and what, the, 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 the testimonies are very, very useful. Uh, it, it really brings to life, because going back to, to the way we ran the chat rooms, we asked, okay, have you encountered, and, and I could have put here, no, no, nothing can never happen to me. There, there were plenty of students who said that. But, but in the same bracket, when we asked, have you ever encountered, tell us about it, tell us about it, give us an example, and how did you feel? So that's what, you know, bring in to, to what does it do to, to the college students? If you uh, have, you know, if you ever, if you ask your, your son or daughter, so how do they feel? What did, you know, how did you react? I, I was raised in, in Israel. I, I've never had this issue, but my son at uh, uh, fifth grade, somebody, I've never heard that story until, you know, being out of Israel, uh, 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 a coin rolled, and uh, he picked it up. And a kid on the playground called me, called him a Jew. Well, his first reaction was to hit the, 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 the kid, and of course he was taken to the principal. I've never experienced that in, in Jerusalem. Nobody could.